Maddie, thanks for joining me again, mate, for round, round two of the uh, High Performance Podcast. <laughs> how, how are you, buddy, first of all? No, nah, thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Um, it's always great to kick off the day with you, mate. Thanks, buddy. The, the feeling's mutual. Uh, so today, we're talking about self-managed super funds. It's something that uh, I've got a lot of experience in, similar to yourself, so I'm, I'm keen to talk with you about it, um, because self-managed super funds uh, for the last however long, 20 20-ish years, have been a very valuable product for uh, investors, young investors um, or investors that are pre-retirees or post-retirees that really want to um, really want to make their super work for them. So um, yeah, mate, how, how long have, I suppose, how long has your journey around self-managed been going for? Like a couple of years? Have you had have many experiences to date with, with self-managed? Yeah, so look, probably the last sort of three years, um, I, I've really sort of, you know, sunk my teeth into it. Um, I will say, though, I think in the last sort of 12 months, it seems to be becoming really, really popular. So I guess the message is... Be- is going out is getting out there in terms of you can take some control of obviously your, your super um but yeah i think it's obviously a great opportunity it's a great initiative by the government mm. and you know i'm keen to run through a couple of the options mm. um with what you can do both you know obviously with inside property and, and outside of property as well yeah cool so i think i think today what we do which we just spoke about is we'll go through why do a self-managed super fund i think that's really important um rather than just bog down the listeners and the viewers with all the detail of, of self-managed super funds that's quite technical. I figured we'd start with why do a why do a self-managed super fund? What's the what's the benefit? What's the outcome that you can you can achieve by by doing a self-managed super fund? So what do you no, well, I'll ask you. You you're the financial advisor and the accountant. Yep. What what are the benefits and why would people do it? So the what, I like I like the phrase that comes from a book um, highly effective what is it high highly effective habits what is it seven habits of highly effective people that book and there's a principle in that book that says start with the end in mind and i think that's what you need to do with a self-managed super fund to understand its true purpose and its benefit and if you do start with the end in mind that end in mind for most investors is retirement so it's it's getting to 60 or it's getting to 65 and it's having enough money to be able to self-fund their own retirement. And I think that's probably why you would set up a self-managed super fund is so ultimately you'd have more money when you, when you were, were ready to hang up, hang up the tools and chill out and settle down. So I think that's probably my understanding of why you'd set up a self-managed super fund is purely to have a lot more capital when you get to retirement. So you're taking... So essentially with a self-managed super fund, you're taking some ownership... Of, of your own super plan, right, and your retirement plan. Absolutely. So there's a there's a lot of, um, I suppose, there's a little bit of bad publicity in the market right now around self-managed super funds are very hard to, to administer yourself personally. You, you need a lot of help. You need a lot of support. Um, there's a lot of compliance and, and, and red tape attached to a self-managed super fund. But, yes, to, to answer your, your question, if you do manage your own self-managed super, if you get the right experts to do that, what you can actually do is you can have a lot more opportunity within that self-managed super fund to do things that you ordinarily wouldn't be able to do in a industry fund or a retail fund or one of those funds that are generally offered to the market. Um, so absolutely, self-managed super fund gives you that option to, to do, it your, do it yourself and, um, and be a, li- a little bit more creative with your investment options as well. Mm. Yeah, nice, nice. And I guess that's where property comes in because if you were to leave it up to the government with the industry funds and, and whatever else, you wouldn't have the opportunity to, to invest in, in property, uh, I guess, uh, specifically in, in one property, I should, I should specify, right? Correct. So um, like we just mentioned, your, your investment options are so much bigger, so much broader. Generally, with most super options with individuals, um, for example, employees even, they their option generally is the stock market. That, that's all these big industry funds um, invest in, such as the Oz Supers and the, the Aware Supers and all, all, the, all the big players. They offer you a very simple option to invest into the, the stock market, okay, in a, in a bunch of shares that have created an index or a very basic portfolio. With a self-managed super fund, you're spot on. You've got other options. So you've got... 
you can invest in property, you can invest in managed investments that are, that are more actively managed rather than set and forget of a, of a stock market portfolio. You can invest in gold, you can invest in cryptocurrencies. The opportunity for you to invest is much broader. But yeah, I think, I think the big value add or one of the big value adds with being able to create your own self-managed super fund is the ability to invest in residential property uh, to be able to invest in commercial property. And as we all know and as we all appreciate, property is a tangible asset and the property market in Australia, it just continues to go up over a five to 10 year trajectory. Um, quite, quite, quite a significant amount more than the stock market because you'd have a lot more money invested. So mm. I might turn this over to you, matey. Um, Let's go back a little bit with property or with, with self-managed super funds. What's your, what's your um, long-term, I suppose, value that you see from a self-managed super fund? Like yeah. what's, what would, why, would you, why would you set up a self-managed super fund um, or why do you see others setting up self-managed super funds? Yeah, look, it's a good question. I think it's become really popular in the last sort of 12 to 18 months, as I mentioned, and it's probably because of recent events, you know. Um, the stock market, for example, has been quite volatile, um, as we all know, and the housing market, in particular the residential housing market, has really gone strength to strength. And I guess it's far more stable um, than some of the other investment options that you that you that you have, right? So, um, for me personally, um, I see some major benefits to having an SMSF and and then looking to invest in property um, for those reasons, right? It, it's it's far less volatile, um, as you mentioned earlier. The, the Australian property market does go from strength to strength, provided you you purchase in the right area and purchase the right asset within that location. Um, but I I think there are some I guess there are some some key um, points that you'd need to keep in mind, and we chatted about it a little bit off air. But um, I, I really want to get the message out there that there isn't one specific property that's suitable to all SMSF um, uh, purchases, right, or, or, or people, right. Um, you really need to come up with your plan, and as you mentioned, you start with the end in mind. And everyone's, uh, I guess, finish line and, and end game is different depending on you know your financial position, your age, um, your circumstances, your risk appetite, and the list goes on, right? But um, I think it's really important that uh, people understand that um, investing within, within an SMSF, you really want to treat it as though it's a business and you really want to make sure that you're going to, you know, you're going to grow wealth for your retirement within that, um, within that SMSF. So just going back to there isn't one specific property that suits all SMSFs. The reason why I say that is because different people are at different stages of their lives. So, for example, for someone um, in their mid-30s, around our age, um, that purchase is going to look totally different to someone that's in their mid-50s, for example. Okay, um, Budget's going to be different. The loan-to-value ratio is going to be different. Um, I guess the location um, could potentially be different given the time frame for investing and, and how close you are to to obviously retirement and then as you sort of sharpen the pencil a little bit more the actual asset so the type of property that you're buying in terms of the age the condition um, you know is it single dwelling is it multi-dwelling is going to be different um, compared to someone that you know maybe is a little bit younger for example yep and just to touch on that you've got a let's say you've got a 25 year old or a 30 year old that, that's got the um that's got the ability to set up a self-managed super fund what would the what would be the considerations with the property that they might purchase at the age of 25 30 versus an, an individual that's a pre-retiree that might be 55 or, or even 60 um, or even a bit bit younger even 50 to 60 I should say what would be the the different considerations between those two individuals that are ultimately 30 years apart um, my, my understanding is the the younger, individual that would be in a su in a super phase or an accumulation phase they would be more inclined to to purchase property or other assets in a self-managed super fund that were, were were i suppose referred to as growth assets so we're going to continue to grow weren't necessarily producing a lot of income but were quite quite active in terms of growth and the trajectory of those assets whereas a pensioner might be more inclined to 
not necessarily invest in property or assets that are, that are going to grow quite rapidly or quite exponentially. Rather, they'd be more interested in assets that were going to produce income. So I just, I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah, it's a good question. And I guess it's a little bit open-ended. Um, and, and you do have to go back to, all right, what's your end goal here? Okay, so for example, some of those pre-retirees, they might be looking to sell the property within 10 years. Okay, so, so the property that they purchase is going to be totally different to someone that says, let's keep this asset until the day we die, mm. so to speak, right? Um, now, I will say if you're a 25 to 30-year-old, a uh, couple of considerations. Uh, one would be that the property that you're purchasing really does need to withstand the test of time. So is that property going to stand up? Uh, for the next 30 years until retirement because as we know I'm probably not the right podcast to dive into it but there are some restrictions around adding capital works and whatnot to to um, your property if you own it within your super so um, just quickly you can basically only do maintenance items and upkeep on the property um, if it's within your smsf right so really important that the property is going to be able to um, s- stand up and, and be housed and be able to be occupied for, for the next 20 to 30 years, um, you'd absolutely want to target a go- growth um, area. And the reason why you target a growth area is because like we said, we treat it like a business. We want it to go up in value over, over time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the other key component of this is um, in most cases, the lending for SMSF interest rates are a little bit higher than what you get in um, personal um, whenever you're borrowing uh, in your personal name. So that's something to consider as well. So not only would you target a high growth location, but you'd also want to make sure that you can service that loan um, without too much additional, without too many additional payments um, coming from outside the SMSF. So you'd have to have a nice healthy yield as well for that property. And it's just about getting that balance right of, okay, good capital growth, a nice healthy yield, uh, and then also a property that's going to withstand the test of time. Now, really important um, disclaimer here, do not buy any new properties. Um, I'm, I'm really against that, as you know, because the value is in the location. So the, the better location you can get, the better off you're going to be. And, and that typically holds around 80% of your property's value and will more than likely do, you know, make up around 80% of the, of the reason for the capital growth as well. So that's for the 25 to 30-year-old. Now, I'll jump forward to the pre-retiree, so let's say around 55. Now, there's two distinct and very different outcomes here. One might be, okay, we want to buy this property now and we're going to sell it at 65. So we're only going to hold it for a really short period, which, you know, in in the property space, a short period is 10 years. Um, So if if they're looking to invest um, in that instance and if that's their plan, if that's their obviously um, their get out um, plan, I would be targeting a a high quality location that has really, really strong capital growth prospects. And I'd be buying a property slightly underneath the median value um, within that suburb. And, And I'd be buying a property that definitely can withstand the next 10 years, but I'd be looking at a value add property, um, just a cosmetic um, value add. So maybe you can replace a bathroom, replace a kitchen, do some painting or whatnot to really capitalise um, on that location, on that premium location when you're looking to sell. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so that would safeguard you because you're in that strong location, um, because there's consistent demand there and you have that I guess that higher um, growth potential because you are buying underneath the median value Um, I'd be looking to buy something like that Um, and if I was looking to hold the property let's say until until the day you die and you're at the age of 55 I would obviously be targeting a really strong location in terms of um, its economy making sure it has a diverse economy good infrastructure good population growth and I guess having capital growth in mind but I'd almost be looking at really trying to capitalise on a high yielding property. So for example, a duplex or a triplex, that way that can then give you the cash flow that you need and and, and obviously want as you head into retirement and, and as you hold that asset long term. Because, um, you know, put simply, it doesn't matter if that property... Um, you know, increases in value or doubles in value when you're 90 on your deathbed, what you do need is, is the money that it's going to be producing between, <laughs> you know, retirement and, and, and yeah. when, you, when you're obviously, um, you know, when you kick the bucket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> does I that make sense? It does make sense. And I think what I was picking up when I was listening to you then is some pensioners 
will potentially need to factor in the selling of that asset when they're in retirement. For example, five years into retirement, which you mentioned before, some pensioners will hold it until they die. And then that will obviously, you know, turn into, well, that, that will then get distributed by their will. The thing that I want to I want to get your advice and your opinion on is, let's say they do hold that asset. That asset, ideally, that wouldn't have any debt on it because they're they're going into pension phase and they d- don't work anymore, so they don't have that. They don't want. They don't have the appetite for wanting to pay off any debt. So if they have that property and it lasts them twenty or thirty years, I did agree with what you said. It's so important to make sure that you have a good rental yield throughout that period because that property will provide you the income that you need to live off in retirement, and. I think another thing that's really important is that you need the rental almost guarantee in retirement, for example, by how you choose the location correctly in the property purchasing stage, that if you don't want to be 70, 75, 80 years of age and you're trying to find tenants to lease your property because the availability rate is is quite big. So my point is, and I want your take on this, is when you're buying a property in a self-managed super fund to stay in retirement, you want it to provide you that rental yield that's quite that's quite a, a good rental yield and, and quite a solid percentage um, of the dollar, but it also, it, it has longevity to it. It mm. doesn't sort of exhaust after a couple of years and then provide headaches. Mm. No, of course. And I guess my advice around that would be, um, it comes down to your research and making sure that you know the market in which you're buying in and y- Obviously, you're considering the the data within that area. So, what are the vacancy rates? What's the what's the actual gross rental yield and net rental yield for the for the location as well? Um, what does the supply chain look like in terms of are there new buildings being built in the area? Um, you know, is the population growing? What's the economy like? What's it, what what's forecasted for that particular location over a long period? And I guess, you know, I, I guess that's why you either can engage a professional um, like a lot of people do or, um, you know, you do the research yourself to try and understand the market insights. I just had an idea, something I want to touch on. Um, There's a couple of things I want to touch on, but the one particular thing I want to touch on right now, and it comes from a comment that you made earlier around not necessarily encouraging people to buy brand new property off the plan. I've seen that a lot, and I think you and I had a conversation about that the other week. You see a lot of... A lot of investors, whether they're 30, 40, 50, 60, they set up a self-managed super fund. They're excited about the the prospect and the opportunity of buying property. Then they either go out and select that property themselves, okay, and and put that into their self-managed super fund investment strategy that's ultimately going to be how they retire, or they're going to go and get a a buyer's agent, similar to yourself potentially, or they're just going to have someone recommend them to buy a property off the plan that that's going to then be the, the thing that gets them to retirement and ultimately ultimately that they're going to live off in retirement. Both of those can be super dangerous, right? I think you've seen them be super dangerous. I've seen them be super dangerous. I've seen multiple clients come across my desk that weren't, they were, they were prospects, I should say, before they became clients. And I looked at their, their super fund and I looked at the property or the assets in the super fund and I effectively said to them, this isn't going to get you to where you want to be which is the whole purpose of a self-managed super fund. So can you give me your five cents on ultimately bad property and bad property selection and bad property advice in a self-managed super fund? Yeah, okay. And it's probably, this is general as well. It's not just um, isolated or specific to SMSF, right? Um, I would say, look, some red flags that I'd really look... I'll turn it back. So some things that we really look for within um, markets that we're buying in and then the property ultimately is scarcity, okay? That's ultimately what we're after, right? So, and the reason why we're after scarcity is because property is an emotional asset. Um, Most people, I'd say two thirds, if not more than two thirds of people out there aren't looking to invest. They're just looking to house their family and and gain shelter for themselves, right? So um, in that case, they're obviously buying with emotion, right? So we're looking for assets that are not easily replicated, okay? Um, Put simply. So for example, the beachfront um, or the property with views um, is worth far more than the property that you can create, um, you know, out in the middle of... um, 
let's just say um, Western New South Wales or Western Sydney where you can have a hundred of the same items all within a very short um, distance of each other. So I guess some things that I'd be really cautious of are uh, off the plan apartments, um, new house and land packages. And the reason why I'd be careful of that is because the people selling those assets, so really clear here, selling those assets as investments and, and and um, preaching those as investments uh, are doing exactly that. So they're just selling the dream. And in, mo- in most cases, um, they're selling the benefits. Now, the benefits to buying something new are you get great depreciation, yes. You get a brand new shiny property, yes. Likely in the short period that you're not going to have any major maintenance items, yes, because it's all just recently done. But what you're discounting is the value in the property is held within its location, okay? Like it's... it's, it's that is critical. And in most cases, 80% of the property's value is held in its location, okay? So the better, the, the more of your budget that's allocated to that location, the better off you're going to be, okay? The bricks and mortar on top, they're, it's cheap and easy to, to improve, to change, to fix up, okay? Um, what's expensive is buying and selling, buying and selling. And if you get that asset wrong, so if you buy the off-the-plan apartment, um, it costs you money going in and in most cases it's going to cost you a premium to buy that and the reason why it costs you a premium is because you're buying it brand new you're also paying for the sales agent you're also paying for the builder and the developer you're also paying for the marketing campaign and then you <laughs> and then after all those items you're actually paying for the the speed the, the the space of air in which you now own in terms of a high if it's a high-rise building for example um as opposed to putting most of your funds um, towards an existing property in, a, in an existing location. Now, the other item I'll mention is um, a lot of these, uh, I guess, agents selling off the plan apartments or, or new house and land packages, they're giving you data, um, for example, yields, vacancy rates, um, your, your rental return on data that's right now available right so what's happening in real time they're not giving you the data of when that development's finished so they're they're, they're saying for example your two-bedroom apartment in the middle of sydney can attract 500 dollars a week rent Um, the vacancy rate for two-bedroom apartments in sydney is two percent okay now they're telling you that right now before that this hundred lot apartment is built okay so if that's the case how many apartments are going to be available, um, you know, once the development's finished and how, how much demand is there going to be? And is, then is that going to impact not only your rental return, um, the type of tenant that you get and also the value of the property because then there's going to be an oversupply, right? And then once there's an oversupply and a short demand, a, a, a low demand, obviously that's going to have a major impact on, on your rent. Mm-hmm. So an, o- an oversupply for a pensioner, for example just like someone that's a lot younger is going to be a huge issue when they're trying to guarantee that rental income coming in every single week to provide them what they need in retirement. So that's the first issue, okay, of not being strategic with the longevity of these asset selection purchases, if you like. A second thing there, which I just picked up on, which which I'm aware of now, is you're almost getting double hit from the start if you're not mindful with the, the advisor that you use to find these these properties because you're paying for the sales agent to do his job ultimately in the commission he charges then you've got the buyer's agent that's that's effectively helping to to find the property but then ultimately playing the sales agent role as well so there's a conflicted buyer's agent sales agent going on here to really work with the developer of these new buildings to then provide that provide that to the investor. So not only is there a big conflict of interest going on that's not really in the best interest of the client, it's costing the client a hell of a lot more in the beginning and then over time it's not securing that rental income because it hasn't been a strategically placed asset in the best interest of the client. So yeah, I, I just suppose that, that's what I see a lot of and mm. I think you see a lot of it and I've experienced it as well personally. Mm. Um, and I like for a long time I was like, you got you got to get a brand new property 
um, because of all the tax benefits, mm. but that's not the case. No, they're, they're, it's only just a small portion of it. If you get some tax benefits, fantastic, but ultimately um, the capital growth is where you're going to make your wealth. Mm. Um, I'll say as well, unless you are paying for your advice, unless you are paying the individual for the advice, they are not working in your best interest. Whether that's a financial advisor, an accountant, a buyer's agent, um, I don't know, name a couple of others, they are not working in your best interest unless you are paying them for the advice. If you are not paying them and they are giving you advice on investment options, ask them, how are you getting paid? But, but, <laughs> but in, saying, in saying that as well, mate, like, like I, I've, I know of stories where you can, still, you can still be paying for advice. For example, you know, I engage you as the buyer's agent, can pay you for advice but you're getting incentivized elsewhere as well. Now yep. that that's 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 you know that's got a lot of bias in it, and it's 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 a huge issue. I think even it's another, when you're getting paid for advice, even when you're paying for advice. Well, I think it's another question that you can ask and that you can press your your advisors, Correct. whether they're property advisors, financial advisors, or whatever. You know, are you, are you independent? Yeah. Do do you have um, vested interest in in any of these recommendations that you're giving? Now, I know both you and I are very strong on on that, um, and and we we're both independent, and, and you know we're obviously proud of it as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's a question, and, and it's good that people are starting to become more aware of this now um, than what they were in the past. And it's like I've said it before, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why we why I got into this space because the property spruikers out there running a uh, seminar, um, you know, at the local RSL club and filling it with a hundred people and saying that they've only got 50 properties that won't be available tomorrow and they must be bought right now for, you know, a low f- uh, deposit of $500. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, and they're the best investments um, suitable for every single person in the room. You know, I think those days are starting to go now. There's more independent advice out there. Mm. Yeah, there is definitely. Couldn't agree more. Um, what sort of property can you actually purchase in a self-managed super fund? Because mm. there is multiple options. There's mm. residential property. Um, there's commercial property. There's, um, in some instances, property that you can develop with certain rules. Um can you hear your five cents? What, yeah. what sort of property? And then I, I might, um, once you've, you've done your part on types of property, I might even jump in and um, start to talk about some of the benefits for business owners with property as well. Yeah. Well, I think the most basic asset you can buy is just a freestanding home um, within a good location. And when I say freestanding, I just mean typical three bed, one bath, one car or four bed, two bath, two car. And obviously that's attractive for that demographic. That's probably the most... Um, I guess low risk, if you like, if if I could even use that word, but pretty pretty typical property, and then you can move into sort of like multi dwelling stuff, dual occupancies like um, a duplex, for example. So both sides of the duplex. One more reason why we like um, buying duplexes um, for some of our SMSF clients is because it does provide that stronger yield, um, and not only that, if one side is is vacant for any period of time, um, you know you obviously still have some income coming in, so you're a little bit diversified there. But again, um, buying that duplex, uh, you really need to be really, really um, strategic in the location that you're buying it in. So it needs to be in a high growth area. You also want the duplex to be located amongst free standing homes you don't necessarily want the duplex to be with 100 other duplexes in the street as well because then that would create a bit of an oversupply um and then i think that the the other the other one in the in the residential space would be a triplex or potentially even like more of like what we would call a unit block so so four or more um Mm. units and the reason why we'd buy something like that is because of that high cash flow okay um and i guess something with uh you know a triplex for example just to give you um some high level numbers you you could expect probably a seven percent rental yield Mm. and again um if we're buying a triplex in a location we really want it to be around a lot of freestanding houses we don't typically want it to be a high density area um just because we feel that safeguards us in terms of um, mm. you know uh, the capital growth within that area and also the vacancy rates. Now, if we're looking to buy something 
that has four lots or more, so like a unit complex, um, we would typically label that as a legacy property. And, and we do see it a little bit. So I'll give you an example. Someone approaching retirement, maybe 55 or 60, um, you know, they, they have a, a substantial amount of, of um, funds um, available within their SMSF and they basically want to what they refer to as a legacy property. Now, um, why is it a legacy property? Oh, we've labelled it a legacy property and the reason why we have is because it's something that will, they would hold on to and then basically be passed down through their family. So a, a, a nice easy example would be um, they're looking to buy a unit block, so let's just say four, four units um, within a complex. Um, maybe it has, um, you know, I, I guess a, a net income each year of say 50000 I'll just use round numbers, yep. um, you know, so about $1,000 a week or so, that's obviously going to service them really well into retirement. And then ultimately what they'd like to do is they'd pass it through the family. So they can obviously leave, um, you know, put their kids in a, in a really good position and then their grandkids and et cetera, et cetera. And, and the goal would be, you know, to keep that property within the family um, for a really long period of time and just relieve them for, you know, I, I guess relieve that family of any sort of additional mm. um, stress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's other types of property as well. So there's, yeah. there's obviously um, commercial property and, and that's a big one for business owners. Yeah. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of good rules around commercial property inside self-managed super fund to help business owners and, and, and obviously help, um, yeah, help help the economy as well i think um in order to really promote commercial property and commercial development so can you hear five cents on that yeah mate i, I love um the idea of if, if you're a business owner whether you're a tradie you work in an office um uh, you know medical whatever I, I do love the idea and and I, i've got to be careful around tax advice but i do love the idea of owning um a, a space um within your smsf so a commercial space and then having your your business or your entity um lease that space off you and obviously there are tax benefits to that um but yeah certainly something that's becoming more popular and i guess um i think with the tradies just as an example um you know storage units are starting to become really popular and and i guess the reason why they are is because they do have a strong return you have some tax benefits but it's also low acquisition costs you can get you can get a storage unit these days for you know somewhere around two hundred and fifty thousand, which mm. is quite low so really low risk uh you know your business can rent out that rent out the space and obviously you can you know create create your wealth from there mm -hmm. yeah i couldn't agree more um there's other there's other benefits as well with with commercial property the first is definitely what you said just being able to lease it to yourself so being able to hold a commercial property like a storage unit in your super and then if you've got a company or a business you're able to obviously lease that property so that, that's definitely one of the one of the greatest ones also there's you're enabled to as a business owner if you own that commercial property personally let's say you, you own it with your wife or your partner or you, you just own it in your own name you're ab able to actually at a later date when you have enough money in super for example to contribute that asset into super so then super actually takes over the ownership of it and obviously vice versa. So I think there is so much flexibility around commercial property in super and, and what they refer to as business real property that it really does, it does supplement um, how your business operates. It also supplements your, how much money you have in retirement and what assets you have in retirement. And it, um, it actually can really, really help with your the sale value of your business okay because in some instances if you have a storage unit or you have a a, a rental uh, sorry if you have a office space or you have a retail space or whatever it may be held by your super fund for example and in 10 15 years you go and sell that asset out of your super but you also sell the business with it sometimes you can maximize the sale and, and realize actually an an overall greater amount because you're selling the asset as well as selling the business together. Mm, yeah, no, it's such a good point. And I think um, as long as you follow the fundamentals of property investing, whenever you're looking to buy um, a commercial space within your SMSF for business purposes, um, you really do need to follow those fundamentals. And again, scarcity um, is one, making sure that your location's good, um, you know, and then, and then obviously the list goes on. Vacancy rates need mm. to be low as well because in some cases... Um, depending on the location where you live, it, you might be better 
better off just to have your SMSF set up and investing, um, have it set up for investing purposes only, and then you can go and lease your space, mm. um, you know, wherever you may live. And because ultimately that SMSF, um, you know, if it's set up for investment purposes, it could be far better utilised um, somewhere else um, than, than in your own backyard, depending on your own and, situation. And that's so, 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 so important because if your end game is more money in retirement, making sure I've got more money than, I, than I'd ever need in retirement, that's, that's why I'm doing this. And you, you go, well, I've got a business. What do I do? Do I go commercial property for, and help the business out? Or do I go residential property? Um, that's going to be a question that comes up a lot. Um, for both of us, usually I answer that with um, what's going to give you the greatest return? What's going to leave you with the most money in retirement? Usually, usually residential property is going to win that race in terms of overall yield for, that, that's, that's come from that property. But in some instances, um, some businesses really need to secure that commercial property because if they don't, their, their business could be to, to the detriment. So I think... Is that what's your philosophy on if you're sitting there as a business owner and you're like, what what do I invest in this self managed super fund? Do I go commercial or residential? What what would your what would your advice be? What would your guidance be? Yeah, and well, I think it comes back to this is the overall theme of why we're chatting today is that it, the SMSF is you know they're all they're all different, right? And I think we spoke about it right at the top and and what's going to work really well for you and your business in terms of what's available and your own financial situation is going to be completely different to me, right? So I think it's about understanding the individual, understanding their goals. And and just as you were chatting then, I'm starting to think, okay, how many properties does, does the person own? If they have six residential properties, for example, and they're deciding whether or not they want a commercial space or, or a residential... I would probably be more inclined to say, well, let's look at the commercial. You've already got six residential properties. Um, let's diversify a little bit and, and, and I guess take advantage of, you know, the commercial space and how it can complement you. If it's their first um, investment and they, ha- they don't own any residential properties, I'm probably more inclined to say, look, let's look at the residential. It's got a better track record. It's a little bit safer um, and maybe we'll, we'll revisit this down the track, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, a commercial investment in some, in, in some capacity. So it just comes down to the individual and, and where they're at. And I think that's so important with what you just said, which is, is how I like to give financial advice, especially with regards to self-managed super funds, is saying don't have all your eggs in one basket, okay? So you might have a property in your self-managed super fund, right? You might have uh, a little you know, investment fund or share portfolio in your, in your self-managed super fund. You might have, um, in time, a commercial property in your self-managed super fund. So I think that gives you a good overall diversified strategy and safeguard is when you're able to get the positives and safeguard against the negatives of multiple assets. Mm-hmm. And I think keeping, keeping that diversification strategy both in your own individual name and then also doing it in your self-managed super fund overall gives you a very effective um, ground to save on tax a very effective ground to capitalize on growth for the short term to capitalize on growth for the long term and just gives you a structure where you can play between Mm. your personal investments and your super investments to maximise how much you've got in retirement. Yeah, 100%. And what it does is it gives you an opportunity to take advantage of different markets at different times. You know, if one area is going up um, and you've got a stake there, you obviously take advantage of that. If another area isn't doing so well, that's fine as well. And if you have all your eggs in one basket, you're heavily reliant on that one asset class, that one industry, that one location. So, (laughs) mate, I completely agree. And you could even go a step further. Like you could have a residential property, you could have a portfolio of shares, you could have a commercial property in time, potentially if you're a business owner. And then you might even start to diversify even further. So with your residential property, you might have one in Queensland and one in Melbourne. So I do agree. Like really having a good, sound, holistic overall strategy inside and outside of super can make such a difference. Yeah, and it just comes back to, you know, have the end in mind. 
Have what, the, like, what do you want to do? <laughs> you know, do, do you want five properties? Do you want one property? Do you want ten? Yeah, What's yeah. your plan? You and know, and obviously you want to be able to pivot and stay a little bit flexible. Um, but ultimately, like, what's your plan here? And then you and then you set it out and you go to execute it. And I think I think that's what's really missing is people transact or investors transact. So they say, I'll buy this property or I'll buy that property or, or I'll buy this commercial property or for the business or I'll do this. But they don't. They don't start with the end. They don't. They don't go well. When I'm 60 and I'm having this conversation with my wife on whether I've got enough money or not to, to sit there and go on holidays and, and enjoy life, that's not where they're thinking. Mm. They're thinking too much in right now. Um, and so I think it's important to not just make assumptions and not just go with it because it could be a good idea. You've got to start with, yeah, how, mu- how much money do you really want in retirement? And the reality is, and, and we've spoken about this on the last podcast, a lot of retirees will say that to me, I wish I had got advice 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And I think if, if you were, like, if you, you've got to pretend you're 60 or you're 65 now because if you need $2 million in retirement as a 60-year-old self-funded right now or in 20 years' time, do the math. And the math might be that investing in a share portfolio or in an industry fund or a basic super fund that your employer provides might not get you there Mm. but investing that money into a better a better selection of assets like property resi commercial whatever it may be might actually get you to what you need so be conscious and mindful of what you can do now to really enable how much you do have in retirement Mm. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, look, there's no magic bullet. There's no, um, you know, one size fits all or secret strategy or, or anything like that. It's just about getting some good advice when you're young and, and taking some action and getting some good people in your corner. And I said that to a, a guy that came in for financial advice the other day. I said, look, mate, I, I'm not going to give you any great advice. You, you're actually doing really well. Like I said that to him. I said, you've got a simple strategy right now that is working for you and to be honest with you all i'm going to advise you is to keep doing more of what you're currently doing because it's really good he had he had good property inside and outside of of super he he was diversified into respective managed funds he was tax effective with how he was doing it and i said you're doing a really great job Mm. um i did recommend him to you just to get the oversight of the property selection and whether it was in his best long-term interest but i think as technical as some of this stuff sounds, the essence of it is keep it ridiculously simple. You don't need to go and be a share trader. You don't need to go and do all this crazy select buying of gold and, and playing with the, the stock market. You can keep it really simple and just go, look, a good property inside my super and in my own name, you know, um, and, and a, a good little portfolio of shares or an investment fund um, and potentially in time diversifying into commercial property is all you need to really to really get the growth and, and, and the eventual yield that you're going to need yeah and that's what I love about property um, when you say it's no sh- you know it's it's really I guess low stress you don't have to be worrying about it you're not trading on it every day you're not checking your property's value every single day um, it's very much a set and forget strategy and I think in most cases um, unless you're a, an active investor, um, I think that uh, being a passive in, investor um, in property is the way to go and, and that really does lend itself to the SMSF strategy. Now, I want to – absolutely. And I want to talk a bit, a bit now about, like, how, how to get started, how to go about a self-managed super fund because um, sometimes – people reach out and they say oh hey ryan i've got thirty thousand dollars in my super can i set up a self-managed super fund um and that's kind of not allowed so Mm -hmm. i just want to go spend a bit of time going over like what would be the steps like how would you set up a self-managed super fund how how would you get property how would you do all of this Mm -hmm. so it's quite clear for someone that's watching or listening to go yeah cool that's what steps you'd need to take now I'll start with the negative and you can kind of get it, you can make it nicer as we go along. Um, there's rules and regulations. And, and for me to give advice, our general ruling is you need at least a couple of hundred thousand in super. Like what I, when I say super, combined super. So if you have yourself and your partner collectively, you need a couple of hundred grand. Um, if you've got four people in a, in a, in a close-knit family, you still just need a couple of hundred grand. Then you can generally um, start to 
set up a self-managed super fund and start to do things like buy property. Um, in regards to buying property, you obviously need finance as well. Mm. I think that's a fair call. Yeah. Now, what's your take on that? Yeah. Um, look, what, I, what you need? I guess, look, yeah, what you need, obviously the first thing you need to do, and, and you probably skimmed over it because you see it a lot, you need to go and see an accountant or financial advisor to, to find out, one, whether or not you're eligible um, to, to set up a super, which you just mentioned. Um, and then you need to, I guess, create create the SMSF as well. Um, once you, you've done that and you've spoken to your financial advisor or your accountant, um, then you can start to consider whether a property is going to be a good option for you or not, right? So property may or may not be. Um, if it is a good option for you, then you can start to discuss, okay, what are my lending options here? Um, now, I'll just say generally speaking, um, just from, from my experiences, um, you know, not all lenders will lend to SMSFs, um, and, and also, in some cases, you may have to play, pay a slightly higher interest rate. So that's something that you need to consider as well. Once you understand um, your your budget, where your money's coming from, so the lender and obviously the rate that you're paying, then you can start to, I guess, frame up a little bit of a, a, a brief as to what type of property um, would really suit you well. And when I say type, I mean what type of an investment, not whether or not a three-bedroom, one-bath or a four-bedroom, two-bath is going to suit you, okay? So what type of investment you're really going to need. And I think um, the best course of action um, if you are working with a financial advisor and an accountant is obviously to engage an independent property advisor and everyone sit around the table and say okay this is where Mr and Mrs Smith are at um, this is what we want to do this is their plan and everyone get on the boat to head in that same in, into that direction so um, it's all about obviously collectively everyone working together to, mm. to the common goal and, and that's for um, obviously the individual to get the best outcome now once your budget your targeted yield um, you know is determined um, obviously you start to look at the, the age of the individual and then their risk appetite what other investments do they already have? Do they already have six investment properties within their own personal names, you know, as an example? Um, or is this their first first um, um, investment purchase and it just so happens to be within their SMSF? So um, you really need to understand all of that because that's going to help determine what type of property you buy mm. and where to obviously best suit their investment strategy. Yep, yep, yep. The, the, absolutely. So... The minimum limit that we spoke about before is obviously a couple hundred thousand. Generally, um, a financier or, or, a, or a, I wouldn't say a bank because banks don't really do the lending anymore. So it's, it's, there's only a couple of lenders left in the self-managed super fund space that will lend for property in super. They'll generally want a 70% LVR or loan to value ratio in layman's terms, meaning you've got to put up 30% deposit from that couple of hundred grand that you need in super. So generally the, the, the limit or the couple of hundred thousand you need in super generally is gonna be a good chunk of the deposit that would be for the property. Um, but what I think is important as well that you did touch on is having, having once you've got a couple of hundred thousand at least in your super, you can allocate some to the deposit for the property the, one of the lenders in that space will obviously provide you the loan and then ideally you have a little bit of capital left over or a little bit of money left over to, to sit in the cash account, right, to, to, safeguard, to safeguard the super. Maybe a, a little bit of extra money to put into a little investment fund or portfolio of shares. So, um, yeah, I, I find that most of the banks are looking for around a, around a 70%. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then I, I guess you need a, a bit of a cash reserve there in case you know yeah. some items happen, some issues happen with the, with the property itself. So, um, and 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 if you have uh, an experienced and reputable accountant or financial advisor, they'll be able to explain all of that stuff to you as well. Yeah. Now, if I if I uh, if I wanted to set up a self managed super fund myself and my wife, um, we had a couple hundred thousand in super. The people that I I would want to be getting like surrounded by would be like you said a financial planner and accountant. Financial planner obviously gives you the advice on this is how we diversify your fund. This is this is how we need to go about where the money goes and how the money goes into the particular assets. The accountant would obviously structure the self managed super fund. Would set up the self managed super fund, and then. In addition to the financial advisor suggesting where the money goes and where the money gets invested into, 
because that financial advisor probably doesn't have property experience, that's when it would get referred or recommended to yourself to really make sure that big asset in the fund, such as property, was selected correct. Yeah, and that's exactly right. I think it's just about pulling in the experts within their field to get the best outcome. And, and that's that's where we step in and we sit down with the financial advisor and the accountant, like I said before, to understand holistically what the plan is and then also um, un- that gives us the best opportunity to obviously buy the best property for the individual, um, as I said. And... Um, you know, we, we I think it's important to make sure that if you are engaging a, a, a buyer's agent to assist with this, making sure that they're a qualified property investment advisor, making sure that they're independent as well, and making sure that they have experience with helping people purchase within their SMSF. So they've got some runs on the board. Absolutely. Um, is there anything else that you'd want to want to know before we wrap up? Because what, what I'm thinking, I just kind of had the thought as we are talking, <laughs> um, like I love this space. I've, got a, I've, I've been doing the accounting and financial planning in this self-managed super fund space for well over a decade now. So I've got a, I've got a great passion for it. I've managed to, managed to do some great, great stuff in this space. I know you have as well. Um, I'm keen to keep helping people in this space and, um, you know, just, just adding value because I know we've got so much value to give. Um, maybe we do something like, Jump on a jump on a free live, or jump on a couple of free lives over the next couple of weeks, or couple of months, or whatever you think, and just start taking some questions. Mm. You know, good old good old Q and A to to be able to help people. I don't know. What are your thoughts on something, yeah, no, something like that? No, I would love to, um, and I think it's important to get some good information out there yeah. as well. All right, yeah. there's a lot of misinformation out there, and there's a lot of people out there trying to take advantage. Um, you know, of buyers and investors. So I think if, if we could jump on a Q&A and obviously share some of our experience and, and, and hopefully um, steer some people into, um, you know, some good advice, that, that'd be great. Really, yeah. really good. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know how we'll do it, whether it's a Facebook Live or, or a, Zoom, a Zoom call or whatever it may be, I'll, I'll speak to the team because I'm, I'm keen to keep doing this because I think a lot of the guidance and advice we've touched on today is super, super valuable. I think it will start to open, open the minds of you know, the 35-year-old or the 30-year-old and, and the 55-year-old the on what their opportunity can be to really maximise in retirement. So I think we definitely pursue this and, and, and open this up and really give that guidance and advice that we can. Um, I also want to make sure people can get in contact with you. Like, let's say they, they can't jump on, a, on the live or, or get the advice. Um, tell me a little bit where people can find you as well because I would much rather them get in contact with you if they're considering an SMSF or they've already got an SMSF and they want to make sure that they're securing the right assets for that that you know longevity that we spoke about in retirement, where can they find you? Yeah, well, we're obviously on all the socials, um, Sharp Property Buyers, and if you want to jump on our website, sharpproperty.com.au, uh, jump on there and then, yeah, you can... Um yeah, reach out to us via via email and, and the prompts online. So we'd love to chat, answer any questions that anyone has for sure. Yeah, yeah. and same, same with our business strategic advisory in Erina. If anyone has any questions, you can find us on Instagram, you can find us on Facebook, you can send us a DM and just ask for some help around self-managed super funds. We'd be more than happy to help you. Uh, I'm definitely excited about jumping in with you, starting to do some live live calls around self-managed super, answering the market's questions so that you guys can uh, make a lot more money in retirement, which I think self-managed super and managing your own super is a, is a, a great vehicle and a great product, if done correctly, with the right people to really maximise how much you're living off when you hit, you know, when you hit 60. So thanks for your time, Maddie. Muchly appreciated again. Thank you.